So hello everybody, today I have a big, huge pleasure of being here with a, a friend that I, I have the, the, the pleasure of uh, finding during the, the, the training that I received from Paradigm uh, related to human performance and he like uh, did it um, magnanimously and I was like really impressed with his experience, uh, Bob Mosqueira. So, he agreed to talk to us for the channel and give uh, a little hint for us about his experience. Bob, thank you for accepting the invitation. It was uh, really nice from you. I know you are really busy. Uh, could you tell a, a little bit about your background? How did you get until uh, where you are now uh, to help us? Sure, Hugo, I, I, I'd, I'd be glad to. I have about 40 years of, of experience uh, in the health, safety, and environmental area. Uh, I have both domestic and international experience. Primarily, most of my career was in the oil and gas industry, although early in my career, I started off in the, in the mining industry, both as a, uh, as a worker, as I you know, progressed my way through my ed education. So I've, I've held a, a variety of positions at the plant level sites, I worked at a refinery for, for about 10 years. I worked in the International Oil and Gas Division for a, a major operator for five years and then about 20 years for an oil field service provider. During that time, I held a variety of positions beginning in entry level in health, safety, and in environmental. Then as I progressed in my career, I got into leadership training and development as well as process improvement, Six Sigma, quality management, things of that nature, as they were all part of an effective health and safety management system and process for the companies and just held a variety of positions, like I said, from um, entry level to a manager at uh, health, safety, and environmental manager at various plants, and then up through the, uh, the, the corporate level, ultimately, to a, a senior vice president. Wow! <laughs> and about the last uh, last last year and a half, I've been doing uh, consulting primarily in the human organizational performance area with with Paradigm Human Performance. Yeah, and that's where I, I reach you. And Bob, I want to start off asking, what's the difference that you see from the the earlier years of your career related to health and safety in the companies, and what you are seeing now with uh, this new wave? of the new view, hop, safety and everything. Is it uh, noticeable that, that the change, is there a change, there is no change? So give me your thoughts on this, please. Oh, I, I, I like the question, Hugo. I've seen a lot of changes in, in, in my career. When I first um, decided to, to go down this path in health, safety and environmental, I was one of the few people that had an actual degree in it. There weren't a lot of places in that point in time where you could get a degree in safety or, or environmental. So I was one of the, the, the few people to do that. Then most of the people that I worked with came out of operations or legal or different, different, places, different places like that. So early in my career, I saw a lot of things that were compliance focused because particularly in the United States, at that point in time, late 70s, early 80s, there were a lot of regulations being passed and put into place in different organizations and, and industries, whether it was on the safety or in environmental end. So I saw that early, early in my career. However, though, I saw a pretty quick migration, particularly for mature companies, to say, we need to go beyond compliance and let's really look at how do we protect our people because it's safer and more efficient and productive to have a safe workplace, particularly as work was getting more complicated then and a lot of different um, automation was coming into place. Even back then, just different types of um, equipment was being upgraded. So at that point in time, I saw a shift probably, I would say, uh, mid to late 80s, more of a management system. Let's incorporate this. And also I saw a lot 
with line management ownership. So I saw a shift from, okay, here's the safety environmental group that's gonna be focused on all this regulatory compliance we have to do. We'll have training around that and enforcement to a shift of, wait a minute, this needs to be owned by operations because it's part and parcel of how you're doing your work. When you're executing your work, you execute it safely and you figure out how to comply with the rules. So I saw a nice shift there for some organizations that were able to really integrate health and safety with operations. But to do that requires, and I saw, saw this happening early too, a different mindset of the health and safety professional. And that being, you gotta understand and see the world from the point of view of operations. Okay, that was easy for me to do because I kind of grew up in operations. Like I said, I, I worked as a operator as I continued my education. So to me, that just kind of naturally fit. You know, and as I was early in my career having a lot of conversations with operations and they, they kind of didn't know that, you know, my background and says, well, you know, if you think you know so much about management systems and compliance and how to run this plant, maybe you should. I said, I probably could because I've, I've, I've done this work <laughs> or maybe, maybe you, you know how to operate this piece of equipment. I said, matter of fact, I do. And we can go, go do that. So my point is, is a nice fit to see how a, a line supervisor could integrate health safety with his his day-to-day -day operations. Then the next wave of change I saw was in the late 80s, 80s, early 90s, as I was working in a in an oil refinery in Southern California, and the whole the entire industry at that point of view, in time, there was about a three year window when there were various um, process upsets, explosions in the in the petrochemical and refining industry. So there was a huge emphasis came from a regulatory point of view to look at the process safety. And again, that was a big change for the safety professionals because once again, the majority of the focus prior to that from, from my peer group at the time was mainly occupational safety, looking at how people are getting injured at work, not looking at how the equipment or the process can cause an injury, or in this case, cause an impact to the community as well as others in the plant. So then that, that what, what I saw happen at that point in time then, from an engineering standpoint, safety got closer together with looking at engineers as they're designing processes, as you're looking at pressure vessels, piping, instrumentation, things of that nature, well, yeah, they're, of course they're doing their design reviews and things like that, but relative to just incorporating the safety point of view into that, I saw as another, as another you know, like phase of change that went through in the health and, health and safety area. So that was a lot of work. I've seen that in the 90s. Then as we, you know, progressed, progressed through, where once again, another shift I saw is a lot of safety professionals were again, focusing on traditional, traditional indicators and measures, whether that's the number of days away from work, restricted duty, recordable, et cetera. And the phenomenon was that, yeah, a lot of work was done to reduce those, However, particularly in the United States and particularly in the oil and gas industry, the fatality rate did not change. And in some cases it increased. So there was too much emphasis on the small stuff because that's a number people were looking at as opposed to, hey, let's really, if we want to, if we're targeting no injuries or we're targeting zero let's target let's start with zero fatalities let's get there first so i saw a shift there then that's what really opened the door particularly in the oil and gas industry from my point of view is hey we need to do things differently so there were different um 
different committees and organizations put together to say, let's look at how other industries are doing this and what are we seeing? Thus, that really opened up the door and gave people a much broader perspective into things like human and organizational performance, safety differently, safety one, safety two, whatever label you want to put it on. So I saw another shift in that area for people to broaden their thinking and looking at, hey, maybe we have the wrong measures here. Maybe it's time for another shift. So long answer to your question, but those are some of the major things that I saw over my career, which kind of gets us to where we are today. And much like I said early on, when there was that shift from compliance to management systems and things like that, I see another shift now needed in the skill set of the safety professional to be able to better support the organization and the business unit leaders, as well as the operations leaders, to look at the world differently now and look at it through the lens of human and organizational performance principles, as opposed to their traditional lens, which a lot of health and safety professionals have been trained in. So it requires a different skill set. And I believe it also requires a skill set of leadership, facilitation, and working in teams and understanding how to maximize all the talent so you can figure out how do we create this environment where we could execute safely and people can contribute to the maximum of their abilities. Yes, that's something that I, I really think all the time about. Uh, as a safety pro, uh, I try to, to, to look for a, a balance between being close to the, to the managers and the decision makers of the company, but not being far from the operators. So trying to build this, this bridge, uh, because I noticed that uh, throughout the time, safety pros, they think, they're thinking about protecting themselves and not the employees, protecting their jobs, uh, if you will. They were too close from the, the decision makers, the managers, the plant managers, they have an aligned speech with those guys, but they forgot the main reason that they are working for the company that is protecting people and, and assets. So I think that's a, that's a good point, Hugo, and how, how I always put it with the team that, that, that I worked with. I said, what I'm going to do on this, on this leadership team, whatever level the, the organization I was working in, I kind of approached it pretty much the same and said, look, what I'm going to bring to the table here I'm going to bring a reality check of what really is going on in our operations. Okay. And that's beyond looking at data, you know, I'm not talking about just looking at the data. What's the processes that we have in place that's driving the data and what really got people's attention. I said, okay, here's our critical high risk task that we have. How confident are you that we're operating we're operating correctly here and safe because these are high risk. These can cause a fatality. Oh, we haven't had a fatality in, in 10 years, so we must be doing well. I said, really? How do you know that? Well, you don't. I said, okay, let's look at what we find out in just looking at normal work. I said, we're finding a lot of, a lot of issues around lockout, tagout, working at heights, et cetera, that you don't have a consequence for. So that's where we need to put our focus. So bringing that kind of reality check to it, I think is important because that, like you said, then you're that bridge between here's what's really going on in the workplace and here's the decision makers and let's try to react proactively instead of waiting till something happens and then call it a one-off when it's in fact, not a one-off. This is how we do things. Again, that's the typical drift model in, in human performance work is imagined versus work is done, but let's not wait till the incident occurs. Let's go deal with this. This is reality and let's go fix it. And yeah. I find people, people respond to that, but you're right. You got to, somebody's got to be that bridge between the two to line that up. And that's kind of some skill sets I see. For the, for the safety professional to adopt. 
Yes. Uh, another thing that I want your opinion on is the the all the safety professionals they we've been taught on how to learn from bad events or events with bad outcomes or events that lost production out of a specification right. and everything. But we were never taught about how to learn from normal work or learn from the success. So what would be your advice for the safety pros that could uh, use the, the company normal activities to learn and to, and to improve since it's like Honegal says 98% of the time, everything is going well. Right, if, what every well, 98% of the time or whatever number you want to put there, it's going well because you because you didn't have an unwanted outcome. Okay, so let's look at how was success created is how I like to look at it. How was success created? Okay, well, then it comes down to well, what's the starting point? Well, my view is you got a couple options. As I just mentioned, you can look at your high-risk work and say, how do we know our high-risk work is really safe? By not looking at the results, but looking at What's our process that drives the results? How robust is it? And are, do our controls, what are our controls in place? Are we hoping that we have, you know, human intervention and behavior, right? Or do we have some engineering controls? How do we measure and, and manage our, our risk? The other starting part, point could be, what is critical to, to safe operations and, and to uh, produce a quality product? What are those key things there? Same application should go. Let's look at normal work and let's see how success was created. And we may find some very good things that are happening in one group that aren't happening in the other group, or we may find the same things that occur when we have a consequence. We're just not waiting for the consequence. You know what I mean? So that to me then, let's look at normal work. Let's look how how success was created. The other nice part about that when you do it, you don't have the emotion of the event. Therefore, people are going to be more transparent and say, well, hey, this is how people, from my experience, they love to tell you how they do their work. If you're interested, show up and you, you're meeting them in their work location. Hey, show me what you do. I want to figure this out. They'll be glad to tell you. And so what I look at, go out there and see what's really going on. Don't read all the procedures and all the manuals ahead of time. Go out there and see what really happens. Then circle back and say, oh, are we doing what we said? Or maybe this is a better way to do it. We, we don't know. You know, but really look at those critical, those critical tasks and critical processes that are driving whatever results we're looking at, whether they're safety, operations, quality related, or things of that nature. Yeah, another thing that I note in my experience that is much smaller than yours, but uh, I, I, I'm an observer. So <laughs> usually I, I'm doing what you just mentioned, you're observing the, the mm. people's work, is that uh, the safety pros, they were told that the ones that are starting this journey of new view and everything, uh, they were told that counting KPIs as uh, lost work day cases or days away or severity rates and, and all this uh, compliance stuff, legal stuff is not right. It's wrong. So we need to change for proactive indicators and, and all this uh, near misses and everything. But I realized that they are counting everything at the same way. They just changed the in Brazil, we say we change the descent, but we keep praying, <laughs> you know. So we are not counting uh, days away anymore, but we are counting near misses as it was uh, days away. So in the same way, just forcing people to report because we need to have a number. Have you seen something similar? Uh, just not the, the same KPI, but the methodology and everything behind it, working at the same way with no value uh, added? Yeah, I, 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 I see what you're saying. And to me, when it's sometimes when a major becomes a key performance indicator, it loses its effectiveness because people tend to manage a number, okay? Because yes. that's a, you describe that's it a, perfectly. <laughs> yeah, because that's a, that's a KPI that we're associating some kind of worth to. 
whether it's recognition or financial or part of performance or, or, or whatever. And I kind of look at it as, um, you know, what's the, what are we really looking for, for here? You know, so again, I'll go back to let's identify, you know, how we're going to reduce risk in these critical areas. And so, you know, to me, it's looking at how you can do that. And again, by going out, seeing how real work is done, seeing what the risk and the hazards are, and then saying, okay, we improved our risk because we're no longer relying on operator intervention here. We've put an engineering control. We have an early warning system. We have other things that we put in place to, to do that. You know what I mean? So you can, you, can, you can look at that and look for that evidence. And to me, that's, a much, that's much better than just looking at, at, at a number because the way I look at it, whether you're measuring days away from work, restricted duty or whatever, that's fine, you can measure it, but don't draw conclusions that that equals a safe workplace, okay? So to me then, part of the other indicators that you're putting into the equation to say, where are we, how safe are we, how mature are we? You look at these other, other key, key factors that you have going on. What are we doing to reduce, to reduce risk? What are we doing in our high, our high hazard task areas to, to reduce risk? How is this happening? And then you see what other activities are going on there. Then you can draw some conclusions on how safe are our existing processes? Are we really doing them correctly? And again, when you look at it with no event, you don't have the emotion and people are more they're just more comfortable to speak up and tell you what's really going on. You know, yes. like I, the only way for me to, I've seen this a couple of times. Yeah. Our, we have all of our safety rules and our life-saving rules, whatever term you want to use. We're not, we're never going to go under a suspended load. Okay, fine. Well, the only way this person can get under this piece of equipment to make a key adjustment is to put his hand under there. Okay. You're under a suspended load. Okay, that's been going on for a long time. Okay, well, let's put an engineering control in and people figured it out and it's fixed. But again, you don't wait till the event occurs to do that. Yes. So to me, the getting back to what you said about, yeah, so we're now we're gonna, we want all these near misses to come in. Okay, well then my term is like, okay, what are you gonna do with them? You know, let's figure out what's really critical and significant and let's go work on that and figure out how we reduce the risk in those critical processes. Because I'm all about the critical few as opposed to the trivial many. We don't need to gather a bunch of, a bunch of data and then we'll, what are you gonna do with it, you know? Yes, perfect. Uh, another thing, Bob, um, most of the companies that are implementing the new view uh, nowadays and some specialists, they, they argue that the best way uh, to in, start the, this this journey is to find some champions, some sponsors or somebody like this inside, and then using those focal points to spread the the, me the, the message. Do you think it's the one possible way, the best way? How, how do you see this? This really starting the journey to the first the kickoff. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. No. Good. Good. Uh, good. Good question. How, how I like to look at it is, I like to say, okay, let's meet you where you are, and figure out how to move you a couple steps forward. So part of meeting you where you are is understanding, okay, what is your what are your health and safety processes today? What are the key things that you do? How aligned with operations are you? Is this just the safety department's role or is it is it integrated with uh, operations or somewhere in between like where where are we here what's our what's our starting point okay that's one piece I look at the another piece I, I look at is okay what what's driving you to now go a different direction what is it how did you come to the conclusion that you want to go a, a different direction are you responding to a major event is your management a little uncomfortable on where you are? But some, something's driving it. So let's figure out 
what that is. Then we can collaborate and talk about, okay, what's the, what's the logical starting point? then typically that discussion will identify, okay, we're concerned about this area and I may have somebody in management that agrees with me or in operations. Okay, we'll go explore that. And if you don't, okay, then we'll figure out, okay, so if the starting point of entry is with the safety professionals, fine then. Okay, let's figure out where we are in the organization how we want to move forward and then how we can make the case, where's the point of entry to, to drive this change and how does it, does it fit in with the bigger picture of where the business is and what role can this play? So, you know, I mean, I kind of do it on a situation basis to see where the organization is, how they got to where they are today, where they want to go, and then figure out how we can strategically move them forward. Yes, make, makes more sense than just applying the same recipe for, for everything. Yeah, because you, you, you don't, I mean, you don't want to do something just for the sake of doing it. You know, what's the value? What's, what's the current pain point today? Or maybe we're just responding to, look, we, we see these trends going on in our industry. And whether it's what I find is people respond to fatality prevention. Yes. At all levels. They, you know, and again, you ask the question, okay, great, you're fatality free for X years. What do you contribute your success to? See what answer you get. They might have a good answer. Who knows? You know, yeah. or I've heard this a lot. Well, we have a great safety record. We have a low TRIR, but we have a couple fatalities every year. Okay, <laughs> let's let's talk about that then. You know what I mean? And see see where they are. And saying, okay, well, this, this approach, we'll go attack that area and we'll go help you improve that. Yes. Uh, so one of the, the, the most, uh, the nicest surprise I have during the, the HOP training paradigm was the tools that you guys presented for uh, practical use, like the, the WITH methodology, mm -hmm. the, the DRIFT methodology, and, and all this, uh, these tools that, you can start using just after the training. So, uh, okay. yeah. So, could you uh, tell me, like, there was how, what of, uh, uh, which were the, the the main tools that you used during the journey, or or if if there is a, a special one that you always use, or something that you think it's indispensable for uh, going well in the journey. Yeah, you just hit on a, a, a couple key points, Hugo. And let me expand on that first one. I really like what you said about the drift model being a, uh, a, a key tool, because it is. Like I said earlier, that's what gives us a clear picture of reality and what our workers face on a day-to-day -day basis. So in summary, what the drift model is basically saying is every organization has rules, procedures, manuals, checklist, all of these tools that were designed by people to how to execute work and how to train workers on how to execute work. So we call that work as imagine, and that's the line up there, okay? So typically what happens is when there's no unwanted outcome, or in this case, no injury, most leaders believe, oh, everybody's working to all these procedures and manuals and training that they have. When in reality, if you go out to the workplace and see how work is really done, there's kind of a gap between that work is imagined line and work is done. Because there's different challenges that come into play that one, you might not remember all your training. Two, the way the procedure was written up to execute the work may not be possible in the way the workplace is configured. So, Workers kind of figure out how to manage all that stuff on a regular basis pretty well. They figure it out until they run into some hazards that come into play and there's an incident and then everybody points to the worker and says, then, then we'll go find a rule up here that says they didn't do something and that's where the focus is, okay? So what human performance is saying, look, that's not reality. Reality is that there is a gap here on how real work occurs, which ties into some key principles around human performance, which to me, these are like the fundamentals. 
So human and organizational performance is saying that people are going to make mistakes. Even our best people make mistakes. So we're never going to operate perfectly like all of our training and our manuals and checklists say. So let's recognize that people are, are going to make mistakes. Okay. Air likely situations can be identified, prevented, and managed. So if we accept that people make mistakes and we plan for it, and we look at those air likely situations, we can figure out what to do to help them manage the messiness and the complexity of work. As opposed to, again, how I was trained early, you get the right procedures, the right training, the right checklist in place, and people will operate perfectly and we won't have any injuries. That's not reality. People are gonna make mistakes, so let's plan for the mistake, okay? Then the third one is, you know, organizational values and organizational processes drive behavior. Okay, so instead of just looking at, okay, what the worker did and where the rule didn't, wasn't followed, let's look at what the organization did. Was the work set up properly? Are there, are the right tools, equipment, machines in place? Are they simple or are they confusing? Is it easy to identify that critical switch to lock out or is it complicated? So it looks beyond just the act of the worker, it looks to the organization and the process is set up to execute the work and the values of the organization, which ties into, okay, how do people respond when something happens? It's going to drive, it's going to drive behavior, which is going to drive errors or not. So if somebody points out, hey, we don't operate this way, we need to make a change because this procedure doesn't work. And somebody tells you, I don't want to hear it, just follow the rule because we have to follow the rule. And if you don't, something bad will happen. And no one's going to say anything. Okay. So my point is that drift model is foundational to understanding a new way of thinking in human and organizational performance. So you can use it both proactively and reactively. So I kind of see that as a as, as a key tool, if that makes sense. Then the other one you mentioned was the WITH model. Let me touch on that a bit. Okay, that's an acronym for the, um, the workplace is the W. The I is the individual doing the work. The T is the task that you have to do. And the H is the human nature of, the, of it. Okay, so you got four phenomena there. So I like to start in the middle and say, okay, let's look at the I and the T. Typically we have a task that needs to be done. Okay, we know what the task is. We know when it needs to be done, what it looks like. We have equipment to do it. We have procedures to do it, et cetera. Question is, do we have a person with the knowledge, skills, and ability that match that task? And that's typically what you do. You design your work processes, you train your people, you equip them to execute that work, okay? now. Then I go over to the W. Okay, well, where's the work being executed? Is it being executed in your plant? Is it being executed somewhere else at a customer site? Is it being executed in the customer's workplace? My point is the work conditions <clears throat> will have a separate set of issues that need to be looked at. So does the work that need to be done really fit where we are or are the displays a little confusing? Do you have a confined space to go in? Do you have all these other hazards to work around that no one maybe really thought of? So you have to check the workplace in addition to the task and the person doing it. And the fourth piece, the human nature of it, okay, is the person highly experienced, complacent, they overconfident, or are they a little bit stressed, or are they underconfident, or are they not well-trained? What's their mindset? Where, where are they? What's going on with them? All those four factors come into play, which could create those error likely situations. So knowing the phenomenon of those four things and the associated potential errors underneath each category <clears throat> can help us identify and prevent those errors. So you're right, Hugo, those are two key tools that you can begin using immediately once you understand them you know, and then have those as the basis to start this change of mindset, which this whole thing is when you get down to it, 
it's a it's a change of mindset and i kind of look at it like i was explaining earlier in my whole journey through the health and safety area for the last 40 years okay everything that got us to where we are today is good and 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 was needed and at the point in time where it was brought into play it made total sense so we still, in my view, we still use that. You don't throw that away. You build off of that and say, now we're going to look at these tools, our, our safety processes, through the lens of human and organizational performance. So instead of saying, we're going to create the perfect system with the perfect rules and train our workers and they're going to operate 100% of the time per the rule, we're saying, no, people are going to make mistakes. We can predict these errors. We can respond appropriately and we could figure this out to teach them how to recognize all the various hazards and everything that's going on around them that work is more complex than we think it is. And there's a lot of uh, variability to manage out there. And these tools can help us manage that. So to me, it's a, it's a mindset shift that's really important. And once the safety professionals adopt that, then yes, you can work and influence and train the other leaders in the company to adopt that and move the system forward. Yes, perfect, Bob. Thank you for the masterpiece. So the time is flying. Uh, I want to thank you a lot for the time. I know you are really busy in all these activities that you've been developing. I want you please to share your contacts and, and talk a little bit about your current projects, how people can reach you, how you can help companies in each situation and, and everything. It's, uh, the microphone is yours. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, thank, th thank you, Hugo. As I said earlier, I'm, uh, I'm doing consulting with Paradigm Human Performance. We're a company headquartered in, in the UK. I'm working here out of uh, Houston, Texas and looking after a lot of our um, a lot of our projects here in the United States as well as in uh, other areas. And uh, actually we also have a webinar that we offer every, every week. That is at uh, 8 a.m. Central time. If anybody would like to log in, it's at paradigmhp.com. Or if anybody wants to contact me about any of the things we talked about in this video or perhaps would be interested in attending a fundamentals course that we put on periodically, such as the one you attended. Again, you could just reach me at uh, uh, bob.machetta at paradigmhp.com. So I can spell that out if you want or send you the info, Hugo, whatever is easiest to do, we can, uh, we can put that in. But yeah, I'd be glad to speak to anyone about this in more detail, or like I said earlier, if there's interest, we could do another um, another fundamentals course just to introduce this to people as a, that's something that we uh, do for, for the industry on a regular basis, just as a way to, to promote human organizational performance as well as our company. So we could set something like that up if there's interest go, going forward to do that. Thank you. I just want to know that I recommend that the fundamentals course, if you guys have the opportunity, please apply. You're not going you're not to regret. Thank you, Bob. You're welcome, Hugo. Thanks for having me. But it's been a pleasure. Thank you.